Hello, I'm Richard Quartz, Chief Executive of the British Council for Offices, the BCO, and welcome to a special edition of our series of interviews we're calling The New Normal. Now, BCO members who've seen other episodes in this series will know that each week I talk to a prominent member about office-related issues and the coronavirus. But this week is a bit different, which is why it's a special, because we are looking at something else, and that subject is politics. And I'm absolutely delighted that my guest today is Sir Craig Oliver. Now, Sir Craig started his media career in 1992 as a reporter for STV, and after that he had stints with ITV, Channel 4, and Channel 5. In 2006, he moved to the BBC, where his roles included editor of the 10 o'clock news and the 2010 general election broadcast. In 2010, he also became controller of English news output for BBC Global News. Now in 2011, Craig had a change and he left the BBC to become director of politics and communications to the then prime minister, David Cameron, rem remaining a, a at Mr. Cameron's side until his resignation in 2016. And in 2016, Craig received a knighthood in the resignation honours list. So welcome, Craig. Hello, Richard. How are you? Well, thank you very much for agreeing to spend a bit of time with the BCO to chat about uh, the coronavirus and related political issues. And I'd like to start, if I may, with your views on how you feel the government has handled the crisis so far? I think they've done pretty well, and I think it's quite important to try and give them the benefit of the doubt in this. If you start at first principles, the government has never seen anything like that. No government around the world has ever seen anything like this, and it's presented a unique set of circumstances, and a set of circumstances has never been seen before. So it's extraordinarily difficult. And I think if you have conversations, as I do with cabinet ministers and people who are in number 10 and number 11, behind the scenes, that I think they'd quite openly admit that there were stages where they'd made mistakes. Did they get testing right? Did they get the schemes that are designed to get money to businesses right? Immediately, no. But it's extraordinary circumstances. It's extraordinary circumstances where hundreds of billions of pounds have been, had to be made available, also at a time where the health service is under threat. And at the beginning of all this, I think what we considered to be a victory is to make sure that the health service didn't fall over. And actually the government's done quite well in making sure that it's had new hospitals, extra capacity to spare, and it hasn't fallen over so far. So from that perspective, it's done well. The challenges keep coming. Uh, I think that we are now starting to focus on the damage that's done to the economy and how do we make sure that as well as protecting the health service, we also protect the economy. But I think there'll be plenty of time later when there's an inquiry to really, really delve into this and say, well, where were the mistakes made? At the moment, I think the national mood is how do we support the government in trying to get us through this? Thank you. I mean, taking it on specifically to, to the PM, and Boris Johnson. Do you think Boris's personal experience of, of having the virus and, and being very seriously ill will have changed his approach, not just to dealing with the crisis, but to government more generally? I think it's undoubtedly true. Um, there was a lot of discussion at the time about how quite how serious it was for the prime minister. My understanding is that, you know, he was taken into a, an um, the ICU intensive care unit because it was absolutely necessary and there was a real possibility that he could have died from this as a point at which in coronavirus where it turns one way or another and if you're in intensive care that is a serious problem for you and I think going through that experience a near-death experience is always going to be a life-changing moment for somebody it's always going to make them reassess I think one of the things that's come out of this crisis and perhaps we can look at this a bit more detail after this is that there really does feel like there's been a shift in terms of what is valued, what's important. What we commonly talk about is the key workers and whether or not our society has valued that enough. Have we actually invested enough in the health service? Are we actually in a situation where businesses have got this right as well? And I think all people are reassessing that. 
but I suspect having had a near-death experience, um, that makes you reassess it even more. Another life-changing experience that's happened to him is that he's had a son in the last few days. Um, and that also, I think, makes people think about this. My worry as a father of three is the impact that this has had on young people, what it's going to have on their futures. And I think there's been a lot of thought given to how are we making sure that the economy is properly protected? How are we making sure that young people have opportunities and chances? And I'm sure that that would also have been something that has made things more sharply focused for him. I'm sure that's right. I mean, the, the profound effect of being so seriously ill you know, must have a, must leave, leave, a, leave a lasting impression. I'm going to come back, if I, if I may, to some societal changes and, and the sort of points you touched upon, Craig, in a minute. But before that, I'd just like to, to look at Brexit briefly, if, if we could. Remember that. It, well, it is perhaps extraordinary to think that, you know, not that long ago, this time last year and, and sometime after that, you know, the nation was still obsessing about Brexit. Uh, of course, we hadn't left the European Union. We, 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 have, we have now. But it, it was, it was the, nation, the national obsession. But we are in this transitional phase, you know, all other things being equal. We have left the European Union, for good or for ill, but we, the transition expires on the 31st of December. Do you think the government will seek an extension to that, accepting what is going on globally at the moment with the crisis? Well, of course, you're absolutely right. It's extraordinary, isn't it? We spent over three years in complete paroxysms about Brexit. It seemed to paralyse our politics. It seemed impossible to actually reach a conclusion. And then it seemed to unblock with a general election where, the, where um, it felt as if the people had spoken to some degree or other. What I think is extraordinary is how something that was just front and centre by a country mile has just been displaced completely by coronavirus. It feels a very, very dim and distant issue. And of course it isn't. It is a serious issue. It's a real problem for the country. My suspicion is that you have to look at the form of the government in this and the people there. What they do is that they talk very, very tough. They are very, very clear that something is an impossibility, that they will remain resolute. And then nearer the time the fudge is found. So we were told in no uncertain terms that no British Prime Minister could accept a border in the Irish Sea. Lo and behold, the thing that happened that unblocked everything was a border in the Irish Sea. We were told that there would be a no-deal Brexit and we couldn't possibly accept certain conditions. And, of course, the fudge was made. Um, you know, there was a bit of sleight of hand, a bit of misdirection, and we looked another way and the deal was passed and things moved on. My expectation is, I think, that particularly in a situation where coronavirus is as virulent as it is and the impact that it's having on health and the economy, I don't think the government will want to see uh, the problem of a no-deal Brexit happen. I also don't think that the European Union will either, but there is some tough talking going on at the moment, and I fully expect that some form, form of fudge will be found again. Mm. I think you're probably right, Craig. I, I agree. Um, I, I'll, I'll come back now, if I may, to, to the sort of societal changes you were, you were talking about, the key workers and so forth, and the government's agenda. So, what do you think is going to happen to the rest of the government's agenda pre-crisis? And again, it's easy to forget that it was only on December the 12th that, that Boris Johnson won a stunning victory, 80-seat majority seemed imperious, and then, you know, completely knocked off course by this, this by the, the pandemic. But it, accepting that we may well be living with the virus, if not in its current state, then the consequences of it for a very long time to come. How will the government get back on track with that agenda that it had, even if, it, even if it's able to do so? I don't think it will. And I, that's not to say be critical. I think it's just simply the cases that coronavirus is a generation changing, agenda setting situation. And the way in which the world was seen before um, is not the same as it is going to be seen for some time. We have a situation where how are we going to fund the huge sums of money that have had to be borrowed um, in order to actually deliver. I saw the other day that the government had borrowed a further £230 billion, I think, just to make sure that the current account was balanced because of the problems they've had. We're going to see issues with tax receipts coming in. We're going to see issues about what is going to happen about whether or not we can actually keep the furlough scheme going 
when there is also pressure to increase the, the, the value of that from 80% to 100%. All of these things are huge issues that we are going to live with for a very long time. And that means that the agenda that was there before is going to be difficult to get back to. There was one story on the news this morning that I thought illustrated that very well, was people were saying that currently that in London, the tube is operating at 5% capacity. But if you actually increase that capacity from 5 to 10%, it wouldn't be able to cope. Now, anybody who lives in London, thinking about if we're going to try and release, ease the lockdown, public transport is going to be a massive issue on that. So how do you, in an age of social distancing, get people into tube stations and onto tubes and moving? If really the capacity of the tube is going to be 10% and struggling, then we have got major problems. And that is only one problem in one city in the United Kingdom. It's just a completely different way of having to think about things. And I represent a lot of businesses. I speak to a lot of businesses. I advise a lot of businesses at the moment. And all of them are having to completely rethink the way in which they operate in the world. It is quite extraordinary. I think, unsurprisingly, as I sort of mentioned in my introduction, the the standard format for these interviews is to focus on property-related issues, and, and we've been looking in, in some detail at the impact on the office. But in the wider community, in the absence of a vaccine, which is the only panacea for this, you know, the social distancing will remain to a, a greater or lesser extent. And and I'll come on to, to one other specific tool, perhaps in the armory, in, in a second. But it is very difficult to imagine how anything remotely normal can, can operate while social distancing has to continue. But I'd like to, to come on, if, if I may, briefly, Craig, to international cooperation, because to me, this is particularly interesting. And why do you think it is that international cooperation has been so limited or in many cases completely absent? In the, concept, in the climate of, of the crisis. And I think specifically of the European Union, which has acted very much not like a union, the UN, which has been virtually silent and nothing from the Security Council, obviously the WHO has been active, but nothing for the, from the Security Council. So do you think this is an indication of the re-emergence of the nation state as an independent unit? Or is this simply just a temporary blip and we will actually get back you know if, if ever there was a time when the, the world needed unity and cooperation it was now and yet it's been so marked by its absence in so many ways so i think one of the things that we discovered um you know after 2015 when we saw brexit the election of trump you know trinka stella in italy the rise of alternative for deutschland in germany even macron to an extent was that you saw the the willingness of peoples to overthrow an established order and that established order in many ways thought and acted the same it was critiqued as being a kind of metropolitan liberal elite um, that was pro-globalization pro-immigration and that people reacted against that one of the things that that grouping of countries had managed to do and those like-minded people was to make sure that international institutions cooperated and governments worked together. And we saw that, I think, probably most forcefully after the 2008 um, banking crash and banking crisis. We also saw it in lots of different ways. For example, Ebola when it was in Liberia and Sierra Leone. That, that's something that we don't talk about much, but was actually extraordinary international cooperation stopped that spreading and being a problem. What we have seen since 2015 in a number of areas is the growth of populism and nationalism and the belief in the nation state and the belief in the, in the country is important. And we've seen that in different ways. And I think what, what, what we are losing and what we have missed is the willingness to internationally cooperate. And that is clearly a problem in this case. In the United States, you do not have a federal government that is not only leading the entirety of the United States, but also leading the world. You have 50 separate governors who are behaving in different ways. So you see the governor of New York, um, Governor Cuomo, doing a great job. But then you see the governor of Georgia, um, who's saying, I'm going to open tattoo parlors and acting like the mayor in Jaws, saying, well, I'm going to keep the beach open. Um, it's, it's extraordinary. And of course, you know, the, the, of course, coronavirus does not respect the borders of states and it doesn't respect the borders of countries. And so we've missed that. And that clearly is a problem. And not having set views and a set approach is as clearly a problem here, I think. It, I agree completely. And it does strike me as utterly extraordinary that, that it has been 
so absent. I'd, I'd just like to continue, if I may, on the societal change and the impact of this. And do you think, Craig, that uh, the Western democracies in particular are about to witness a fundamental shift in the relationship between the citizen and the state. And, and by that, I mean that I, I cannot imagine that there's going to be much of a debate or, or anything at all on funding for the NHS in the years to come. The NHS is, is going to be exceptionally well resourced. That's going to have to be paid for, which will almost certainly result in, in higher taxes. You, you can't borrow for everything. There will, I suspect, be a significant invasion of privacy that would not have been a tolerable or even imagined not very long ago because data tracking of where we are and, and who we see contact tracing will be necessary as the only other weapon apart from social distancing in the absence of a vaccine so i could see some pretty significant change here along the road do you think i'm right so I should explain to your viewers, if they can hear it, it's raining pretty heavily here in West London. So if they can hear a drumming sound in the background, that's what it is. Yeah, I mean, I think what's interesting is that the name of your interview series is The New Normal. And I would say that The New Normal really is volatility. What we've seen across the last few years is extraordinary situation where things have flipped back and forth, up and down to an extraordinary degree. We've seen that not just in the UK, but in politics around the world. And that volatility, I think, is going to be with us for some time. And the predicting where it's going to jump and where it's going to land, I think, is going to be a very difficult thing. We want to make assumptions in the middle of this crisis that we now know that this is where people will go. I agree with you, actually. I think that, that no government, particularly a conservative government, which I expect to be around for the next few years, is going to be able to do anything other than have a new settlement with the National Health Service. We are that I just don't think it will pass or any questions and difficulties that are raised around that. I don't think that will be acceptable. Having said that, we do also have a government whose MPs were elected on the basis often of, be, of believing in sound money and how we get back to a situation where we have a control over money and a feeling that we, we somehow actually can limit things is going to be fascinating. Theresa May famously said um, in the 2017 election, there's no magic money tree. Well, we've seen that actually there is a magic money tree and hundreds of billions of pounds can be generated very, very quickly. Now, when you see that, um, people in the future are going to say, well, that happened in that circumstance. Can it happen again? There are all obvious um, consequences to it, to it longer term. So that volatility and the impact of this, are we going to see millions of people unemployed? Are we going to see businesses go? Are we going to be an see an acceleration of trends that mean that certain businesses are wiped out faster than we thought they would be and others grow more dramatically? Are young people going to have the opportunities that they deserve and need in a way that previous generations had? All of this is very, very difficult to see at the moment. And I think that how people react longer term is going to be fascinating because people are in for some shocks. I think that the government has done a very good job in explaining to people that there is a serious problem in terms of the health service falling over if we don't have a lockdown. What I think has become is less clear is that the impact of that long term in the medium term is very, very severe. You know, it's basic economics. If people stop spending money, that has a very severe knock on effect. It's um, what Keynes called the paradox of thrift. And that is a real worry. And I think that there are a number of cabinet ministers at the moment who are who can foresee the economic problems coming down the track and are deeply worried about it but also know that two things can be true. Keep the lockdown as it is, or the health service falls over, keep the lockdown as it is, and the economy suffers very badly. Indeed so, and I don't envy any politician in, in this position. Uh, it, it, to be in government must be extraordinarily difficult. And we are, of course, in, in as well as the, dealing with the pandemic, we're in the middle of, of an unprecedented unprecedented economic experiment because you say that the magic money tree does appear to exist after all because the amount of money that is being borrowed which is effectively being paid for by printing more money electronically and the bank of england buying government debt is a is an experiment on a on a global scale that has never never happened 
to this extent before, and, and we all have to see how it pans out. And, and the danger of inf inflation coming back and killing value will be at the back of central bankers and, and, and treasury ministers' minds all, all over the world. We could have carried on talking for a lot longer, Craig, but sadly we are out of time. These interviews are meant to be a snapshot, but has, it's been absolutely fascinating. I'm extremely grateful to you for sparing a bit of time with me and the BCO. Um, thank you very much indeed. Unfortunately, that is all we have time for today. So from the Craig Oliver and from me, thank you very much and goodbye.